Sure, thank you very much. So let me start. Okay, so do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, let me just minimize the cameras. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here for this uh, virtual seminar. Since this is my first interaction with the team, uh, I'll take this as an opportunity to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Youssef and I'm a new postdoc at the Mechanical Engineering Department and a member of the Institute of Integrated Energy Systems uh, at UVEC. Uh, I just completed my uh, PhD from the University of British Columbia based on my research in the field of uh, membrane-based uh, gas separation. Uh, before that, I worked in the natural gas industry as a process engineer for around 10 years. Uh, beside my PhD, uh, I hold a Master and Bachelor in Chemical Engineering. Uh, I look forward to meeting you in person in a couple of months from now, and uh, until then, I can always be reached on my uh, UVEC email address in this slide. Um, blending hydrogen with natural gas for a cleaner combustion or for the co-transmission purposes are both uh, trending research topics nowadays. While everyone is researching blending hydrogen with natural gas, we are actually going the opposite and researching the separation of uh, hydrogen off natural gas. Uh, that is finding ways to separate hydrogen from natural gas economically uh, for various reasons that I'll be elaborating on later in uh, this presentation. So hydrogen, uh, I'll just give a brief uh, background about the topic. So hydrogen is a clean energy carrier. Now, I'm quite sure that you have come across it in the news headlines, LinkedIn hashtags, research posters, etc. As you might know, hydrogen is being proposed and as an alternative uh, as an alternative to fossil fuels, given the zero CO2 emissions associated with its combustion. So let me start this seminar with this colorful slide that explains the hydrogen production spectrum. Uh, hydrogen can be produced from various sources, from water, from natural gas, or even from coal. In short, this color labeling classifies the hydrogen based on the feedstock used for its production, uh, as well as the status of the CO2 resulting from the production process. Now, obviously, water is the cleanest feedstock for hydrogen production. There's no carbon associated with, with this process. And if it happens that the energy required for the electrolysis process, which is the process used for hydrogen production of water, is sourced from renewables, say wind or solar, we refer then to this hydrogen as green hydrogen. There are other color codes, such as the pink hydrogen, uh, for example, wherein we utilize nuclear power to produce hydrogen from water, again, using the electrolysis process. And many other colors, and you'll hear a lot of these terms in the, in, in, you know, in, in the literature. There's no basis for these colors, just people, sometimes you find two different colors, but effectively they reflect the same process. But it's just the, you know, the research terms that we're dealing with these days. In terms of the hydrocarbons, natural gas is the traditional and the most common feedstock for hydrogen's production. Currently, most of Canada's natural gas, uh, or sorry, most of Canada's hydrogen is produced from natural gas. And we refer to that hydrogen as gray hydrogen, meaning that it is produced from natural gas, but the CO2 resulting from the pyrolysis or the reforming process uh, the CO2 is being, being released to atmosphere, unfortunately. Moving from the gray hydrogen production to the blue hydrogen production is a global goal. You'll probably hear about it in, all over in the news, which implies that releasing the associated CO2 to the atmosphere is not acceptable anymore. Instead, the CO2 must be captured and sequestered. And when we're talking about CO2 here, we're not talking about the CO2 resulting from the combustion of the fossil fuel. No, we're talking about the CO2 that is resulting from the process of producing hydrogen of uh, natural gas. So let me take you a step back, maybe to the 80s or the 90s of the last century. During that time, natural gas was always promoted as an environment-friendly fossil fuel, particularly when marketed against the crude oil-based fuels, such as diesel, for example. However, with the accelerated global warming and all the policies being established around that, we find ourselves over that era, and we are now trying to find an even cleaner form of energy. And we, we, here we speak about hydrogen. 
Despite the environmental advantage, hydrogen is not the best when it comes to energy content, particularly when it's being assessed on a volumetric basis. Noting that hydrogen has only one third of the natural gas heating value on a volume basis. So natural gas usually has a heating value range somewhere between 950 to 1050 BTU per scuff. Whereas on a volume basis, hydrogen is only 300 or 330 BTU per scuff. Now, when it comes to pipeline transported gases, the volume-based energy content is really the realistic measure for gas quality assessment, not the mass basis. I mean, you'll hear a lot about the mass-based heating value of hydrogen, and people go, wow, it's, it's higher even than natural gas. But the point is, marketing hydrogen based on mass, its mass-based calorific value is somewhat misleading when it comes to pipeline gas, yeah? So when you're talking about gases that are stored in vehicles under very high pressure, then yeah, you might be talking about hydro hydrogen on a mass basis, heating value on a mass basis. When it comes to pipelines, no, it's different. And you got to be dealing with the volume-based heating value. Now, despite the bubble made around the hydrogen topic, yeah, practically, Practically, we are quite unfortunate that at least for now, we don't have enough hydrogen to substitute natural gas, yeah? Let's take Canada as an example. Around 15 billion standard cubic feet of natural gas moves around all the pipeline network in Canada every day. It carries around 16 petajoule of energy. Yes, a lot of that is exported to the US, but not the point. The point is, if we intend to substitute this natural gas with hydrogen, then Canada would require at least 100,000 tons of hydrogen per day. Okay, so where do we stand from that today? It is only 10,000 per day. So we, we basically produce only 10% 10, 10 of the total requirement of Canada as in hydrogen. So obviously for now, we cannot substitute natural gas. Now this limitation has driven field exports, experts sorry, to propose blending whatever hydrogen we have in hand with natural gas in an attempt to limit the environmental damage. That is to deliver the required energy output, which is, you know, flow rate multiplied into calorific value, if you like, yet with less CO2 emissions. Now, that being said, if we assume that all the hydrogen that's being produced in Canada right now, which is the 10,000 tons per day, if that is being injected into the Canadian natural gas network, that is mostly in BC and in uh, Alberta, that would result in a gas that is 20% hydrogen by volume. I mean, that's not bad at all, but what is the impact of that? The percentage of hydrogen in hydrogen enriched natural gas, i.e. in the hydrogen natural gas mixture, could vary from very few percentages of hydrogen, say one to 2%, and it can go all the way up to say 20% by volume hydrogen. The concentration depends on many factors, but it really, it's really the hydrogen's availability that dictates the resultant concentration in the mixture. So you're always limited on hydrogen, and that is why you know you set the percentage. It's not like you know you have the hydrogen and you're trying to think about what concentration I should have. That being said, it's quite important to understand the impact of hydrogen's presence on the gas gases heating value i mean the entire blend heating value according to the u.s sales gas specification for example the heating value of a typical natural gas should be around 1000 btu per scuff now all the facilities utilizing natural gas are designed to operate around this heating value for example power stations or power turbines or you know compressors that runs on fuel gas when you come and add nitrogen to that the volume based heating value of the gas drops now the minimum limit, say around 900 BTU per scuff, is, is crossed whenever you start to increase the hydrogen beyond 10%. Now, this really depends on the gas to gas quality, but in many cases, if you have propane and butane and all these high heating value components, then this would allow you to blend higher you know, uh, hydrogen quantities and you might be able to reach all the way up to 20%. Now, this means that compared to, new, to compared to the pure natural gas, yeah, and in order to meet a certain power output, you would be requiring higher volumes of hydrogen enriched natural gas. And that's to be combusted in an engine to, to meet the same power output because the heating value now of the gas is less. Now, 
from an economic perspective, it's not a problem since natural gas is often transacted based on its energy content. We don't buy natural gas based on its volume. You always find the natural gas being priced dollar per million BTU, for example. So it's based on its energy content. But when you need more volumes, it means that you will put higher uh, load on your pipeline network because you know all the pipeline networks it's all about the volumetric flow rate that dictates the hydraulics of the natural gas network that dictates you know the frictional pressure drops etc and usually these natural gas pipelines because they are you know very complex and very big networks it's usually that you design them to you know what you need exactly you don't put much of excess in terms of the volume so you really have no much of margin to play with in terms of volumes now apart from the environmental aspect yeah that is you know blending hydrogen so that you know you get less co2 emissions the co-transmission of hydrogen in the natural gas existing pipeline network is another reason why hydrogen enriched natural gas can be ever encountered now this map here demonstrates the main natural gas pipelines crossing the border between the US and Canada. You know, in the western part, Canada exports natural gas to the US, whereas in the east, the opposite occurs. So Canada imports natural gas from the US. It all depends on the location of gases production and utilization sites, as well as the availability of a transmission system to move the gas around. But at least for now, and in view of the limited quantities of hydrogen that we have, it would be very expensive to build a dedicated pipeline network to transport hydrogen from, say, from Canada's west to, to the east or to central Canada, for example. Maybe that would change once the hydrogen production picks up and that it would be economically justified to build a pipeline network just for hydrogen. But until then, it has been proposed that hydrogen can be injected in one side of the pipeline, say, for example, somewhere near BC, because, you know, you produce hydrogen where you have the feedstock, where is natural gas, and that's somewhere in the, you know, west of Canada, somewhere like BC or Alberta. And then you inject that hydrogen along with the natural gas. And, you know, when it reaches to the east of the country, you go and collect it there. So you have to extract it somewhere back near the destination. So that's what we refer to as co-transmission. Now, our research investigates hydrogen separation from natural gas, but I mean, why? I mean, when everyone's talking about blending, we're talking about separation. Well, the first drive is that some of the fuel gas users are hydrogen intolerant. Think about all the power stations that are built you know, near these pipelines transporting natural gas and you know, has been there for 30 years. They have been designed to be operated with natural gas. And now you are introducing, you know, a foreign gas, which is hydrogen, which is playing around with the heating value of the gas and the properties of the fuel that you are utilizing. So in this case, our objective would be to produce hydrogen free natural gas. I mean, to purify natural gas of its associated hydrogen. Now, what are we going to do with the hydrogen next? That's that's another story. But this is one of the objectives. The second objective could be to extract hydrogen from natural gas post a successful co-transmission process. So you injected the gas in the West country, when I collect it in the East, we're gonna come up with a cheap process to do that. Now, from a process design perspective, our objective would be to meet the targeted purity and recovery of the products. While ensuring a simple process, a process that is does not consume much of energy. Now, since the entire hydrogen subject revolves around reducing emissions, optimizing energy consumptions, uh, reducing uh, CO2 releases to the atmosphere, then it's obviously a priority for us when searching for any new technology so that that technology is, is very you know, friendly to the environment. Okay, so why, why don't we use a cryogenic process? Well, you know, the separation of gas has always been associated with cryogenics. Whenever you talk about gas separations or cryogenics. However, these processes are very, very energy intensive, despite the, you know, the optimization that has been done over the last few decades in these processes design. And many of these processes are licensed processes, but still, they are still regarded as very energy intensive processes. In a cryogenic process, 
the temperature of the hydrogen in rich natural gas in order to separate the hydrogen must be dropped down to at least the methane liquefaction temperature. And then you would leave the hydrogen behind it in the gaseous phase. So you basically, you take the entire bulk gas, you cool it, you condense the methane, which is, you know, the easier to condense, and then you leave the hydrogen in gaseous phase. You collect it, you do further purification. Now, the cryogenic process, as you know, is a combination of uh, refrigeration processes and some gas expansion. Uh, it consumes enormous amount of energy, uh, you know, due to the temperature levels that we're talking about. Now, this figure demonstrates the condensation points or the, the dew point temperatures of methane and hydrogen at various operating pressures, yeah? So, in order to liquefy methane, you know, at atmospheric pressure, methane uh, drops down at negative 162 degrees C. But because of the higher pressure, we are allowed to drop it down at somewhat higher temperature. So we, we drop it down somewhere near negative 100 degrees C in a, in a liquefaction process, if you like. Now, this being said, the use of a cryogenics for hydrogen separation doesn't seem to be economically justified unless, unless natural gas liquefaction is intended anyway. Now, this is the case in LNG plants. In such plants, hydrogen separations become a free byproduct of the methane liquefaction process. Now, it should be noted that in the next decades or maybe two, many LNG facilities are planned in BC to facilitate LNG export to East Asia. Now, in case that these facilities would, would use hydrogen in rich natural gas, then only the separation of hydrogen would be, you know, uh, a byproduct and it would be done at a reasonable cost. Now, in, in, our, in our research, we demonstrate membranes, yeah? our nominated technology for hydrogen separation from natural gas. Now, briefly, membranes are extremely thin polymeric materials, which upon their exposure to high pressure, they would selectively permeate a particular gas, in this case, hydrogen, to the membrane low pressure side, while retaining all the other gases, including methane and the heavier natural gas components at high pressure. Now, these membranes, they make use of the hydrogen gas, smaller molecular size compared to methane to facilitate the separation. As a start, you can think about it on, as, a, as if it's a process of filtration on a molecular level. In a properly designed membrane, the size advantage causes hydrogen to permeate across the membrane, while all the natural gas components are retained at high pressure, which means that the hydrogen, when it's permeating through the membrane, it would lose its pressure because it's overcoming the hydrodynamic resistance of the membrane pores. Yeah. Now, but that's really advantageous because, you know, the bulk gas is natural gas, and then there's a small amount of hydrogen. So it would make, make more sense that you, you, know, you maintain the natural gas components at high pressure, and you don't lose their pressure, because if you lose their pressure, you'll be required to recompress them again. So that's one of the advantages of a membrane system, is that you're keeping um, you know, the, the, the pressure of natural gas uh, unsacrificed. Now, gas separation membranes are mostly offered in the hollow fiber modules demonstrated in this figure. Now, as a start, you can always think about these membrane modules as shell and tube heat exchangers. Concept-wise, they are the same, analogy-wise, but instead of exchanging heat across the, you know, the, the surface area of the tubes, here you are exchanging mass across the surface area of the fibers. Now, Although these membranes, and there are, by, by the way, there are a lot of commercialized membranes out there in the market. Although they are not being, they haven't been developed for hydrogen separation, many of these membranes, or at least a subproduct of them, can offer satisfactory performance when it comes to hydrogen separation from natural gas. Now, frankly speaking, these membranes were made for separation applications that are even more challenging than the one we are interested in, I mean, than hydrogen methane separation. Still, these membranes are imperfect and they would actually pass some of the gases in the wrong direction. For example, in our application, some natural gas would still leak to the membrane, to the permeate side of the membrane along with hydrogen, impacting the separation quality, the product's recovery, etc. I mean, that's one of the reasons why P 
people don't like membranes much because, you know, compared to cryogenics, in cryogenics, you have clear cut in boiling points of these components and you'd be able to, you know, get a very high purities out of the, such processes. Well, it's not the case in a straightforward membrane system because of membranes imperfection. They get to pass the gases in both ways. And that's one of the challenges that we'll be able to overcome in our research. Now, this is a demonstration of a skid mounted membrane system. It's used for air separation, but we can still use the same for hydrogen methane separation. In terms of the modularization, the advantage of the membranes is then being supplied in hollow fiber modules, which over them an outstanding surface area per, per unit volume. You know, and having these systems in such simple design makes it very easy for these systems to be transported from the supplier's place to the installation place you know, with very minimum, uh, you know, installation that's required on site. So they are kind of skid mounted modules, yeah? And this would uh, feature these, you know, membrane modules with a kind of a plug and play feature, just, you know, few, few connections that you have to do and then the system is ready to go. But now there are many applications where membrane-based hydrogen separation units can be utilized. In this presentation, I'll be touching upon three of these uh, applications. The first is what you see here. So, so say an existing pipeline is extended from BC to central Canada. This pipeline used to handle pure natural gas, pure hydrocarbons, but will now ha handle hydrogen enriched natural gas. Being in an existing facility, the turbines might not have been designed to tolerate hydrogen. The, the end tolerance could be due to flame temperature issues because you know hydrogen, when it burns, it, it, the flame temperature of, of it is higher than that of uh, methane. So you know the, the turbines might not be able to, you know, to tolerate such high temperatures. It could be uh, fuel gas heating value concerns, uh, or it can even be sometimes metallurgical reasons. Now, in this case, a membrane unit would be required upstream of the station to guard it against hydrogen. The good part is that, you know, the pressure of natural gas, which is the fuel to this station, is not sacrificed in this separation process. Instead, hydrogen pressure is. Now, the separated hydrogen is not going to be dissipated to atmosphere, but being available in smaller quantities compared to methane, I'll be able to compress it and send it back to the pipeline. Yeah somewhere you know far from the top of point where i took the you know the original feed to the power station the second application has more to do with the co-transmission application again imagine the same pipeline is transporting hydrogen enriched natural gas and once at the intended destination hydrogen can be separated from natural gas for further use using a membrane now since natural gas experiences minimal pressure loss in the separation process, it can be recycled back to the pipeline easily with just a booster compressor. Because remember, our objective here is to collect the hydrogen and it would permeate to the low pressure. Okay, the natural gas is gonna leave the unit with, a, with little of pressure, just overcoming the pressure drop in the hydrogen separation unit, I'll be able to return uh, the natural gas back to the pipeline. Yeah. The last application has something to do with the hydrogen fueling stations that are used to charge the novel hydrogen operated vehicles. Now, as far as I remember, Shell is leading a project for this in BC. Most of the stations, you know, source their hydrogen off site, meaning that the hydrogen is either piped to the station from a nearby hydrogen production facility, and that's rare. But the most, most, of, the, most of these hydrogen stations, they source their hydrogen you know, from periodic visits of a tube trailer that delivers hydrogen to these stations. I mean, remember these, these hydrogen fueling stations are still, you know, in, in the test mode. They didn't get into the very commercialized mode. So our idea is to tap off an existing hydrogen enriched natural gas pipeline and generate the hydrogen on site, i.e. in the back room of a fueling station. Now, again, the resultant natural gas can be sent back to the pipeline. You know, whatever, you, you're not going to tap off the entire inventory of, of, of the pipeline, just going to take a tap off of that and take a small flow rate that is enough to, you know, produce the hydrogen that you are interested in. And the rest of the natural gas can be recycled back 
um, to the pipeline. Now, there are two main challenges here. And among the, you know, among all the applications, the first and the second, the third application is really the, 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 the most challenging one because, because of two reasons. First is the hydrogen's delivery pressure. And the second, it's, it's required purity. Now, there are two standard filling pressures, which are the, if you Google it online, it's the H35 corresponding to 350 bar pressure and the H70, which is corresponding to 700 bar. Now, these pressure levels are very challenging, especially when membranes deliver, the, especially knowing that the membranes would deliver the hydrogen at very low pressure, say around atmospheric pressure. Now, taking this all the way to 350 or 700 bar, that, that's, that's, that's gonna be very difficult, yeah? Now, the second challenge is that uh, hydrogen must, be, must meet a certain purity level and they, you know, people who work in this field, they call it the N4 class purity, and that's 99.97. Now, frankly speaking, this is not possible, at least for now with the available membranes. It's going to be very challenging to produce this ultra high purity, you know, uh, hydrogen. So we might need the assistance of a further unit that does the polishing of the purity. So we might get up to, say, for example, 97, and then you need another unit that takes it all the way to the purity that we are interested in. Okay, so the single stage process is the simplest design of a membrane-based uh, hydrogen uh, methane separation system. This is what you see in uh, this slide. Now, this system requires almost no maintenance due to the absence of rotating items. It's just a you know, kind of a heat exchanger that goes forever. You just keep feeding it and it's gonna be doing the separation. It consumes zero energy because it has, as I said, no, no rotating items. And it, it occupies very limited area. Now, as demonstrated in this sketch, uh, the high pressure hydrogen enriched natural gas flows to the membrane. Hydrogen diffuses to the, through the membrane pores to the low pressure side, while methane continues you know, to the membrane discharge with minimum pressure drop. As I mentioned before, some methane would leak along with hydrogen to the low pressure side. Now, due to membranes imperfection and the view of the status of current commercial membranes, uh, the single stage process wouldn't be economical and wouldn't be attractive to end, you know, at, for end users as it suffers from an unavoidable trade-off between the purity and the recovery. So you want, if you need a very high purity hydrogen, you wouldn't be able to have a, you know, simultaneously a high recovery of hydrogen. There's always a trade-off between them because of if you want more quantity, you have to offer more surface area and the more surface area you, you add, you're gonna give a more chance for methane to diffuse and, you know, ruin up your uh, separation quality. So we have to get over this. Now, we are investigating the use of a two-stage process. So the idea came from the well-established uh, industrial application of CO2 CH4 separation. Yeah, there are a lot of such units available, you know, there in industry. In a two-stage process, we will be able to control both the purity of hydrogen as well as its recovery to very good extent. Of course, I mean, this occurs at the cost of, you know, somewhat more process complexity uh, higher maintenance uh, requirement, higher power demand for the you know interstage compressors. But believe me, this is nothing compared to a cryogenic system, where you will be required to change the phase, you know, of a, of an entire gas stream. Uh, the presence of a recycled stream in a two-stage process, and this is what you see on from going from the second stage on the top back to the membrane feed or to the unit feed. This recycle stream requires extensive iterations to solve you know, the complex material balance arising from that. Now, this solving this would only, would only be possible using a thermodynamic simulator, something like Aspen Heises or Promax, et cetera, or Unisem. However, these simulators, unfortunately, they don't offer membrane units among their standard functions. There is no membrane unit in Aspen Heises, for example. Uh, there is, for example, a distillation column, a heat exchanger, you know, that's standard, but you don't have a membrane unit. So we have to overcome this. So our research um, developed MEMCAL, 
which is a very powerful extension that is user friendly. And that, that extension depicts a membrane stage and can be connected straight with a, a thermodynamic simulator such as HISIS. Uh, it would run inside the simulation environment, okay, to converge the material balance solution around a membrane stage. All what you need to do is to define the permeance of all the gases involved in the separation. Of course, that's being on the membrane supplier input. Uh, set the parameters that are required to converge the model, such as the how much membrane area you'd like to offer, uh, how much permeate pressure would you like to set that. Now, running you know, the membrane unit within the simulator envi simulation environment allows users to utilize all the inbuilt functions available in Aspen HISIS you know, to improve the design. Something like the optimize function, something like the adjust functions, you know? Uh, the case studies, the sensitivities, you know, having, if, if, if these membrane extensions were to run outside the simulation environment, it would be very difficult to link them. Yeah, but we are now running within Aspen Heises or within UNICEF. So this is an example of a two-stage membrane unit that we have simulated in Aspen Heises for the separation of hydrogen from natural gas. Now, to meet the target with purity and recovery, automatic adjust blocks that you see here with the alphabet A were used to manipulate the membrane area. So you play with these membrane areas of the two stages, yeah, after setting the permeate uh, pressures and we'll be able to kind of control both the purity and the recovery of the natural gas that we are trying to produce. So for example, here we were able to purify to drop the hydrogen content from 10% all the way down to one or two percent when attempting to produce pure natural gas and we are able to get a recovery as high as 99 percent of course this is just an example you can do even more than than that with a two-stage process and you can simulate it to produce pure hydrogen than, rather than produce pure natural gas now like any process application we are moving between the development stages so far, we are almost done with the concept and the high level feasibility of such process. Is it feasible? Is it make sense or no? Now, once the simulation work is completed, we'll, we, we will be moving into the experimental setup, depicting you know, the model process. So we will take a membrane from a, you know, a very commercialized membrane supplier and we'll test it in lab under conditions that are equivalent to a real process. And then if that works fine, we will then progress our work to our pilot testing, where we'll be working along with collaboration with a you know, commercial membrane supplier to, you know, to take this further and you know, maybe convince one of the big companies that are responsible or are interested in you know, such project to, you know, to take this further into the industry. You know, the oil and gas industry is not a very friendly industry when it comes to, you know, accepting um, new processes. There is a big, there is a big, you know, emphasis on uh, the reliability issues, and you know, the, you know, the the systems must be sustainable, must be reliable, uh, must be always available. You must have enough sparing because you cannot tolerate any shutdown. So it's not very easy, you know, to introduce a new process or a new technology and you know for the for the oil and gas industry to accept it but we're trying our best that's why we are moving slowly between the various stages of the project such that we will be ending up with something reasonable something that the industry can take it further and be able to um, produce hydrogen in a in a re with a reasonable cost and you know with with minimum uh, energy consumption and all that goes together towards, you know, contributing to the, you know, Canadian strategy of, you know, increasing uh, the reliance on uh, hydrogen as a clear, uh, as a clean uh, energy carrier. So I think that's all I have for today. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for being here, uh, attending this seminar. Thank you very much, and I'll happy, I'll be happy to take your questions. Thanks, Yusuf. Very, very interesting. Good presentation. Um, I've got, I've got a quick question for you. Can you uh, actually, can we get your slides back? I would love it if you could go back to your uh, figure where you were showing 
um, the the geometry for the for the membrane or the fiber um, yeah, sure. separation system. Yeah, sorry, just a sec. Yeah, this one. Yeah, one second. Let me I'm sharing. This one? Uh, I think no. This one? Uh, there was. Uh, there you go. Yeah. yeah can you? Can you, so the the diagrams on the are the figures on the right. Can you talk me through those again? I I think I missed exactly what's happening with this fiber. Like, like where's the flow of, of gas through this thing? Okay. So the these these are the fibers. They are kind of you know. You, if you think about it, it, it's it's very very thin fibers, and these are industrial fibers. They consist of a polymeric materials that has you know several layers. So it's not it's not a single layer that's having a single material. So what you have is uh, something called um, you know kind of composite membranes. They have different um, you know different materials on top of each other. The first material would be kind of acting as a mechanical support. And then you have a selective material, which is, you know, forms the, the outer circumference of the fiber itself. When the gas flows in the outside of these fibers, it starts diffusing through these fibers. And these fibers are, you know, think about it as a tube. They're going to collect all the gases, you know, and then it's going to flow through a channel towards the outlet of the membrane. So how do you, I'm just trying to understand how you control the gas flow. Like how would you port this, right? So let's say oh, you've I got, see what you mean. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? I see what you mean. Yep, yep, I got that. So basically when you force, how do you force it is that all these fibers are collected uh, at the entrance and the very outlet. So what you see here, there is a ceiling between these fibers that prevents the gas from ingressing from, you know, exchanging from both ways of the membrane. If you see what I mean. Mm. So that's so going to be a, tricky, right? The end of that, where you do that ceiling and separation yeah, between. Exactly. Because if you don't do that, then you messed up the entire separation. Yeah. Because yeah. all what you need to do is to keep a barrier between the shell side and the tube side. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So there is always a kind of, you know, it's very, it's, it's analogy wise, very similar to the heat exchangers. But yeah. yes, you, you, yeah, it's a, it's a valid question. You, you, You'll be able to to you know to narrow the gas and then you know collect it selectively from the inner tubes of these fibers or the inner the inner diameter of these fibers. Yeah. Okay. And then so my related question, because you nailed it there, to me this the analogy of course is is a heat exchanger like a shell and tube heat exchanger, um, and I'm just wondering, is there an opportunity to integrate essentially a thermal aspect to your separation system. So I'm imagining some of the, um, you know, the, the permeation of gases through these things, I'm assuming there's a bit of a temperature driven effect around permeation rate, right? And is there a way to take advantage of that in, in the design? Because this does look so much like a heat exchanger to actually improve the separation by using thermal uh, diffusion effects. So we are we are not really using the thermal diffusion diffusion effect. So basically, what's happening in these membranes is that these membranes they utilize the, you know, the the, the potential for the flow is the difference in partial pressure across the both sides of the membrane. So you have, for example, on the left hand side, you have a high high partial pressure of hydrogen, yeah, because of the high pressure, which is the you know the, the main pressure multiplied by the volume fraction of hydrogen. That's the, the, the partial pressure of hydrogen on the feed side. And then there is a, because of the very low pressure on the permeate side, which is usually controlled, you can even operate it under vacuum. Uh, you know, you have very low partial pressure of hydrogen, especially if you use sweep gas. We're not going to use sweep gas here because then you will be required again to separate the hydrogen off the sweep gas and it becomes another separation application. But there is always a difference in the partial pressure. And then once that difference in partial pressure between the feed side and the permeate side, you know, vanishes, you know, the permeation is gonna stop. So it's not a thermal driven process as such. Yes, there will be some temperature drop across the membrane because, you know, you're going from the high pressure side to the low pressure side. 
And sometimes the difference in pressure is high. So you will have some JT effect, Joule Thompson effect because of that. Uh, but there's, there's nothing thermal in that. It's all about the partial pressures of hydrogen across both sides of the membranes. That is really the driving force for the permeation. Now, to permeate, you need pressure difference because that's going to establish the permeation potential. But also you need to overcome the hydrodynamic resistance, I mean, of these pores. I mean, these are called, they are called dense membranes because they are very dense. If you go, if you look on these membrane materials, they go from pore size wise, micro, you start with microfiltration, ultrafiltration, nanofiltration, then reverse osmosis, and we are going smaller and smaller in diameter. And then you go all the way down to what we refer to as dense phase membranes, or these membranes have pore sizes in angstrom size, or even smaller. So you need, in order to flow any gas through, you need a very high pressure difference. Not very high, but you need you know, a, a good pressure ratio across. I mean, these membranes would, would operate with high pressure ratio without being ruptured. So there's nothing thermal as such. I was just trying to use the, you know, the analogy of heat exchangers to, you know, just to, you know, show the difference between here you're exchanging heat, but in our system, we're exchanging mass across the circumference of the fiber. Yeah, no, I, 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 I guess my question wasn't very good. I understand exactly what you're saying. Um, I guess my question is getting with membrane transport, you can often have mixed forces driving transport, not just yes, pressure, okay. but also temperature, yep. right? So um, I guess I was just trying to explore that idea. Is there an opportunity to think about using temperature gradients as well as pressure gradients to drive or improve the permeation? But yeah, I mean, uh, there is all. There's also sometimes people, you know, try to use chemical potentials. Sure. Uh, you know, something like you know, selective ion to transport the. But when we are talking about gases, and they are not kind of, you know, we are talking about gases. They are not or something. So and, you know, all these, you know, uh, kind of membranes which are being prepared apart from you know, the ones which use the solution diffusion kind of partial pressure difference membranes, almost none of these membranes have been commercialized. And what we're trying to do here is not to work on the, uh, you know, the material side of the research. This is not what we're trying to do. We are trying to kind of see or explore the, you know, the, the usage potential of, uh, of the commercial membranes and what we can do best with them how can we play around the imperfections of them by manipulating the process design uh, and define kind of an application window where these membranes can be used. For example, we might end up saying that, okay, because of the very high pressures and the very high, uh, very high uh, purity requirement and the very high pressures that we are looking at, it doesn't make much of sense to use, you know, uh, membrane-based uh, units for fueling stations, for example. But it would make total sense to make them to, to use them, for example, as as a first step, maybe not not not, you know, you can you can do the separation, but we can always do hybrids. I mean, we can still rely on another system. For example, we can use, for example, do the bulk separation of hydrogen using a membrane unit, get to purity, say 97, 98 percent. And then from there onwards, we take it using another technology. Now. Since we are utilizing, you know, a much smaller, or sorry, since we are dealing with much smaller flow rates now, we will be able to, you know, we will be able to utilize two processes instead of one, but still economical because we are dealing with small flow rates, which is only the small of hydrogen, you know, volume of hydrogen plus small amount of impurities, not not the entire bulk gas that we're trying to, you know, deal with. So, you know. Our research is more into defining application window rather than working on the materials. If you Great, see yeah. what I mean. Thank you. Yeah. Jake, looks like you've got you. a question. Yeah, absolutely. And so I just want to talk about the Canadian context here and it's talking about all these intolerant or these H2 intolerant facilities. Is there any profile or characterization about how many of those facilities exist or would it be a, a, a large majority of the natural gas demanders uh, currently or? Is this something that you've looked into or have any insight on? Uh, to be honest, I, you know, all what I know is for now is that, you know, 
almost 80 to 90 percent of the hydrogen is being produced in uh, Alberta and BC, and it's by uh, reforming of natural gas. And uh, what I know is that we are currently producing 3 million tons per year. And that's where I came up with a figure of 10,000 tons per day. Uh, and all, most of that is being gray, uh, meaning that it's, you know, we are releasing the CO2 associated with the reforming process to the atmosphere. Uh, where are we moving to with respect to hydrogen's uh, production? How much we are targeting? Uh, that's something that I have to look at more. But I was trying to get the statistics of the existing you know, status of hydrogen in Canada. Where do we stand today? Yeah. Uh, because, I mean, I've attended, I've attended recently a seminar uh, given by um, John in Fortis, BC, and they're trying to, you know, produce uh, hydrogen. And when I asked him, where is your target? I mean, where do you target hydrogen as in, in terms of, you know, what, what blend of hydrogen natural gas you're looking for? And then he was very optimistic. He's like, yeah, we're targeting for 100. I mean, yes, we all aim for, you know, 100% hydrogen, but we are kind of talking here about what is technically, you know, acceptable. And, you know, this is not, we, we're trying to, we're trying to, you know, deal with existing facilities that are in there. Even your housing appliances, uh, you know, the power stations, you know, we can't in a day or two go and change all this to 100% high. Say you have 100% hydrogen, all these power stations gonna shut down. I mean, they won't be able to, you know, to, to deal with hydrogen. So even 100% hydrogen is not too good. I mean, at the end of the day, we are trying to produce energy and serve all these end users. And if you're not able to satisfy them just because of, you know, you're trying to get clean fuel, then what's the point? Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Jake. Uh, any other questions out there? It doesn't look like it. Um, yeah, that was really interesting, Yusuf. I look forward to uh, your arrival. I think there's lots of uh, lots of overlap with various other projects that are on the go. I think there's some nice synergies in terms of some modeling and network modeling around gas uh, infrastructure transformation, and mm -hmm. uh, and I think also just process wise, there's some nice connections too. Uh, I'd love to chat more with you about it when you're when you're here. Um, anyway, I think that's. Looks like we all we've got for today. Um, thanks so much again, Yusuf, and um, safe travels. So, so we'll see you, I guess, February time frame, hopefully. Sure, sure. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Yusuf. Thank you. Thank you. And happy New Year in advance. You as well. <laughs> see you Thank soon. You. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.